Tyler Fredrickson competed on the 30th season of Worlds Apart where he finished in 7th place. Starting off strong on the White Collar Tribe, Tyler worked closely with Carolyn into the merge where he was soon perceived as a threat and voted out to join the jury. I spoke to Tyler about comparing the NFL fandom with Survivor fandom, just how close he went to winning the game, as well as which previous season he very nearly made the cast for and finding out why he didn't bid on the advantage at the auction. Tyler, welcome to Survivor Oz. Do, do, do. Thanks, Ben. It's good to be here, mate. It's fantastic to have you here. And um, I, I love it when people get involved with the the Australianisms and um, saying things related to us. So I expect lots of mates in this interview. And even, you know, you can do this whole interview in an Australian accent if you really want to, Tyler. Uh, no worries, mate. No worries. <laughs> I, can't, I can't really do it. I can do an English one. I can't really, I can't really carry the... The, the, the Aussie one as long as you guys probably would like, so let's just skip it. A lot, a lot of people actually end up turning a little bit English when they do their Aussie accents, so um, <laughs> as long as it's not a New Zealand accent, I'm, I'm fine with it, so it's, it, it works okay. But um, cl- Fair clearly it's been a few months now since your season's all wrapped up. At the time of recording this, we've just seen the premiere of uh, season 31, but uh, I guess things are now slowly back into regular life after sort of the whole journey of Survivor in the last 18 or so months. Yeah, it's like the Wicked Witch of the West. It's like our Easter. I don't know. It's, it, you're just sort of melting back into irrelevancy. Not that we were much <laughs> relevant to begin with, but within the community, it was fun and exciting for the fans as well. But now it's you're just sort of, yeah, you're disappearing into a thin cloud of smoke back into like normal life, which I'm actually, to be honest, really looking forward to because this was a very busy summer. Mm. And um we wanted to. We we knew, uh, the, you know, the members of the quote Dirty Thirty. We knew that this was going to be an exciting time in life and a season of life that probably wasn't going to going to come back to revisit many of us. So this was the one to just take to the furthest heights, to explore to the farthest regions of you know the space of the charity events and the parties and the screening um, you know parties that we traveled all around for. So. Anyway, it's I'm, I'm it's slowing down. I need some water. <laughs> I need some sleep. I need some spinach. Yeah, I'm feeling good. <laughs> Turning into a bit of Popeye there or something like that to get the. Uh... I just need healthy, man. I need healthy, mate. <laughs> but I guess I mean, with your background, of course, um, in the NFL and sort of through what you've done in your life. I mean, how can you kind of compare the um, the attention that you get from Survivor from being in the NFL? I mean, different crowds, different um, groups of people obviously observe yeah. uh, both things. But, I mean, Survivor fans compared to NFL fans, is there any comparison at all there? You know, the Survivor fans are pretty intense. I think what's made it more interesting this 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 go-round um, is just been the, it's been the social media aspect, being able to reach out to people all across the world. See, when I was playing, I was playing um, basically from 2004 to 2008 and nine. That really wasn't quite an aspect of it so if you want to interact with fans they pretty much had to show up to practice or games and wait for you after maybe they're sending you snail mail that would arrive in your locker room um so this has been a whole nother level of excitement i have to admit man not to like get too down on this but i don't know if this is something that many survivor players actually talk about or ever feel but you know i I did i played in the nfl for about five years with seven different teams i got hired and fired and hired and fired traveled all around the country and came to a point where it kind of just sort of fizzled out the last um the last team I was with was a part of the Arena League, which went, went bankrupt during the whole housing crisis of 2008. And it was kind of like, all right, so I'm so, was sort of forced into retirement. It was kind of pulled from me a little bit, and I was okay with that. With Survivor being so exciting and such a, a such a pinnacle point in my life, such an amazing adventure, it's powerful. It changes the way you see everything. Um, and then to kind of have it disappear, and then now to watch – other people either go back on that journey for the first time, or in our case, it's, uh, in this case of season 31, sort of revisit it again. It's a strange feeling for me to kind of realize, like, ah, a part of me feels like the train left the station and I'm not on it. And I think that'll get easier and easier as the, you know, the seasons play out and the years go by and we spend more time together, sort of talking about it. But um, I'm about to leave in a little bit to go visit with Max and Mike. Max has started a new podcast. Um, tonight, actually, Corinne is going to be there and maybe Vince. And uh, I hope they like, you know, not only talk about the guts and the glory and the excitement of everything, but also to talk about like it is a difficult transition to go from that exciting moment in your life and then to move on to now what is sort of ne- the next stage. And while I am really excited about slowing down a little bit and getting back to the realities of, of my life, um, 
you know, before and after Survivor and how things have sort of shifted. It's um, it was it was strange this morning waking up, and for the first time since I actually played the game, I had all Survivor dreams last night, <laughs> thinking about like the highs and lows and the cold sweats and the excitement of challenges, and it was something. It really um, it really kind of like it hit me in a different spot watching the show back. Yeah. And um, it's been a fun, you know, not to go off and go on, go along too long, but it's been a fun transitional experiment and like seeing how you relate to fame or, you know, very small amounts of fame, at least certainly really like relate to newfound attention and how you transition out of that. I'm really, it's really interesting. And the survivor fan community have a very uh, unique way. I feel of um, talking about the show and obviously interacting. And, and it is one of these, um, areas of, of media, I guess, and TV where people involved in the show, uh, for the most part, are very interactive with the fans. I mean, you know, we obviously um, have great interactions with uh, people from all seasons, and as you would be experiencing now um, with the fame you're talking about, um, you've got this outlet where people can literally send you a question or tweet you and all this sort of stuff, and you can interact with that. And I'm guessing maybe if you're still in the NFL, that would be a lot more controlled, and you probably wouldn't be able to do as much as you do with survivor yeah i I think you 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 probably could i mean um because i think social media is now social media it's however you want to make it the difference is i think when you're in the nfl they're they're not really getting to see much of your personality in fact so much of you is literally masked um and and cloaked in uniform and and you know the, the camera can only get so you can only interact so much on game day so for a lot of it the players are kind of set on a pedestal or set apart and you're really pretty much judged based on your physical actions. Well, what changes, what's different about survivors is that your the cameras are not only right down in the ground on the ground uh, floor getting an, into your face and getting to know you, but you're also being, you know, judged oftentimes on your words and your actions and not just your physical. In fact, sometimes the physical is, is sort of pushed aside. So and, you know, I think audiences or viewers or fans, or whatever you want to call them, really feel like they get to know the real you. Mm. Um, what I've come to learn and certainly how I watched last uh, last night's episode um, with a new found sort of understanding is that there is something called the edit. <laughs> and I think Survivor does probably better than anything else out there an amazing job at really trying to capture three days worth into five or six moments or five or six shots or even five or six minutes, depending on what kind of character you are of your personality during those three days and trying to make it, you know, relatively true to who you were. But oftentimes we know that, you know, there's, they also need to create dichotomies. They need to create polar opposites. There's villains, there's heroes, there's different types of characters that fit in, whether you're dorks or athletes or nerds or sexy or ugly or crazy, whatever it might be, they want to kind of get to the point very quickly and, um, you know, at times it works in your favor, at times it doesn't, where I don't think the NFL really has it either. I mean, I was a kicker and a punter. So either for me, it was very black and white, hmm. you put it through the uprights, you make it or you miss it. And I could hit an amazing shot from 80 yards out that falls one yard short at the end of the day in the stat sheet. It's a no good. So, you know, I'm 0 for 1. I missed. I'm not up to par. And, um, you know, so it's it's uh, it's the the, the 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 there's more gray area, and the editors obviously do an amazing job at sort of you know dwelling there. And uh, sometimes, like I said, sometimes it works for you, sometimes it's against you. Yeah, very much so. We're seeing that a lot, I think, with a few people in this uh, new season. Stephen, uh, maybe in particular, had a very interesting edit. Um, that um, I'm, I'm not sure how he reacted to that, given uh sort of how much since his uh, season he's uh, been involved with the Survivor community. But, yeah, it's very interesting. But go- going into this whole journey, Tyler, were you a massive fan? Did you apply? Did you apply for previous seasons? Was this something that you just decided to do? I mean, how did the whole Survivor journey for you begin? It began actually at training camp my, what was it, my sophomore, junior year in college. And somebody, a bunch of the players were getting together one night. And they said, we got to watch this show. And it was the it was the finale. It was the final tribal council with Richard Hatch. And I watched. I'm like, wow, that was actually really interesting. Of course, you know, I don't know how many millions of people watched it around the world. And then I kind of fell out of it. I never really quite caught on. And I don't know, season two, three, four. I don't through maybe seven or eight went by. And then I kind of watched like maybe I don't know. I'm not really sure, but eight through twelve or eight through thirteen, and really loved the show. But then got involved in the NFL and kind of fell out of it again. Um, life kind of caught in the way. And then I somewhat picked it up again randomly. 
and just was addicted and loved the show and fell in love. So, I'm, you know, from basically like 18 to current, I've never missed an episode. In fact, I just went back a couple of days ago and started watching season two because I've gotten to know a lot of the people from that cast. And it's been really fun to see them in their and, and, and to watch, to see them in their younger days and also watch a show through sort of fresh eyes. Um, and then I was working at a talent agency here in Los Angeles and happened to help a friend get a job internally and looked at her resume one time um, and through the, in the midst of that interviewing process and found out that she worked in casting and Survivor. And I made a quick little joke and aside and said, hey, I'll help you get a job at the, you know, at the agency if you get me a job in Survivor, if you give me <laughs> cast. And she like did a little laugh and said, well, you should make a tape. And I'm like, come on, like I'm not gonna make a tape. And she's like, make a tape. Like I can kind of help you sort of mold, like you know, d- the things that you do and don't say in a tape. And I, I kind of pushed it off for a little bit and told a couple of my friends about it. And a couple of my buddies I went to film school with, they were like, look, you should let's make a tape. So a couple weekends we put a tape together, and I um, suddenly was very quickly put into the casting process because my tape was essentially right at the time that finals was going on for Caramoa in season 26, and I went through the whole process, did very, very well, and they actually cast me on the show. And um, from what I've been able to pick up through little rumblings here or there within casting, I was pulled within a couple days of actually flying out to the Philippines wow. in a uh, place of, I think, I believe Michael Snow came in right. and uh, took over for me. And, you know, some people have made jokes that, like, I look like a Michael Snow with hair, although we're very- – <laughs> We're very much further apart in, in age, <laughs> but um, he came in and, and, and I was pulled out and I, I actually, to be honest, was pretty upset. I was like, you know, forget it. I went through this whole process. Finals week, as I'm sure you guys have heard, is extremely, extremely trying. It's very difficult, mm-hmm. and super intense, and they can, you know, cut you at the with a phone call in your hotel room at any moment. And so I was like, you know, if you guys want me, you know where to find me. And I, I'm done. I'm done with this whole application thing. But because I was further along in the process they left my left my information in the casting bowels or wherever they hold them in the bowels of their files and <laughs> basements and they called me back for 29 actually wow. and i was at that point uh, really busy up in the bay area working on a screenplay um as now that i've just sort of transitioned to be from the agency to becoming a writer and they said we're casting a blood versus water season does anybody in your family want to be in it and i talked to my sister and my who was has has was pregnant my dad has three little boys under the age of 15 and my and i talked to my wife and she was like i don't really know if it's for me and the casting really liked her and thought she might be great for it um, they asked me to make another tape and I said, well, what do you want in that? And they never got back to me. And I sort of said, you know what? Forget it. If they don't want me enough to get back to me in an email, I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to apply again. I already got pushed through this process and it broke my heart. Hmm. And, um, I got a call back a few weeks la- or a few months later, actually, and probably two months later. And they said, whatever, whatever happened to your tape? And I said, whatever happened to my email back? <laughs> and they're like, do you want this or not? And I'm like, well, do you want me or not? And it was sort of this stalemate which of course i was going to budge to ultimately and they said look fine we're casting a whole newbie season you know first time players um all individuals season 30 do you want to try and i'm like yeah and they're like well you better make a tape and i ended up making two and going back out and doing the finals week and fortunately i was remembered by uh lynn spillman and uh probst and a couple of the other executives at cbs and somehow was able to talk and walk and act my way through the process and got on the show. And it, you know, like I told you before, Ben, it, you know, it changes your, it changes your perception of everything that you once thought was real. It changes your life. And for me, you know, in a pretty good way. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. We're discovering a few people, I think from your season were very much meant to be on other seasons. I mean, that's obviously a case with a lot of uh, seasons of survivor. They obviously sure. move people around, but I think more so your season at the moment through the interviews that we're doing. I think this is probably a case of so far everyone I feel is meant to be on other seasons and moved around. So clearly, I mean, we spoke to Lynn Spielman just before your season started and she um, paid note that your season alongside with One World were probably up there with her favourite cast just because of how close you guys are and how good the casting process was. So I think at the end of the day, by moving a few of you around from other seasons, it's worked. Um, for various different reasons. And um, again, we love the what-if scenarios on this show, Tyler, and if these hadn't have happened, then we wouldn't have had the season that we have, and the Dirty 30 might not exist. <laughs> right. Exactly. I mean, look, we are certainly a very, very close cast, as some people either love or hate. And, um, you know, if not the closest cast probably in the history of the show, 
but you know, does it make for did it, did it make for good TV? You know, I don't know. Some people have complained that it wasn't as good, or it was more depressing, or it was difficult to watch, or whatever it might be. Um, all I know is what we did out there, and all I know is what we've done since. And for me, the entire thing has you know completely blown apart my expectations in in the best of ways. So I'm. I'm very pleased with um, the whole process, even though I know some people haven't been. Were Were you um, intrigued then when you get out there for the whole twist, the three tribe um, split by the collars? You're obviously on white collar. I mean, what was your take, I guess, when this was all handed down to you and your thoughts of being on the white collar tribe? I mean, part of it's happening so dang fast. I mean, initially, yeah, we kind of, fi- I kind of figured it'd be, you know, three tribes and a final three. That's the way things had been going up until that point, and they've been going pretty successfully. Um, and you get out there on the mats, and and you know, you finally kind of starting to look at the people around you. And I'm seeing a dude in a suit, and you know, somebody else is dressed well, and other people are kind of dressed in their sort of character stereotypes I mentioned before. And then Jeff says, "You're the white collar tribe," and I'm like, "Okay, okay well, recently I've been out." of my white collar profession to become a writer and a producer. So are they spinning me as how are they moving? How are they maneuvering? me? Okay. Forget all that. Who cares now? What does it mean to be white collar? And what does it mean to start connecting with the people around me? Who is this girl next to me? You know, this beautiful Korean girl. Who's this dude with the slick back hair named Joaquin, you know, like who are these people that I need to start to figure out where they're from, what their background is? Because, you know, I know very quickly that I've, live a very no collar life and in fact right up until a week or two before casting i was cast on the no collar tribe right. they pulled me at the very last second so i know that i live a very no collar existence i happen to work recently a white collar uh, job but i love a blue collar work ethic so i feel like i can kind of melt into any one of those aspects so for me the reality became less about all right what's the collar and what does that mean to you and more about who just are you hmm. and how can i get to know you and how can i kind of begin to infiltrate the things that you love and the ways that I can manipulate you, you know, just like any other, I think, kind of astute survivor player might do it. And that became my goal since the moment I got on those mats and less about thinking about, you know, how this is defining me. Were there connections made early on that necessarily didn't come across on screen? I mean, obviously, you and Carolyn seemed to hit it off quite early. But I mean, were there any relationships that maybe we didn't see you were surprised that we didn't kind of see early on? Uh Maybe not early on. Uh, I think myself and – well, maybe early on. Ma- Max and I actually hit it off very quickly. I I, I enjoy intelligent, intelligent people and intelli- having an intelligent conversation. I knew that Max was a big super fan. In fact, I knew who Max was before we got out there. I knew who Max and So works. I think they've been spoiled uh, by – by the communities right before we even left for um, for Miami and then back out to Nicaragua. So I was kind of excited that Max was there because I called him out on what he did. I asked, what did you, what do you do? And he said that I was a professor and what did you teach? I'm waiting for the response. He said, I taught survivor. And I knew that that was actually legit. Max and I connected Max and I on the first, you know, the first week that we were there spent every time kind of going off because I was close at that point with Carolyn I knew that Joaquin was just a bull in the china shop who just wanted to be athletic, and I knew that I could I could completely connect with him on that level. Like, let's just win, bro. Let's just win. Kind of bro up with him. I knew that Max was close with Shireen because they were kind of the super nerds who were dorking out together. So if Max and I came together, we sort of, we sort of had these two sides um, that we were kind of playing, come together and kind of decide how we're going to now maneuver the vote and if in case we do go – um, it was a really great way. We spent a lot of time out. I don't know if you watched our, on our season, if they showed it much, but out on our no, on our white collar beach, they had this beautiful, huge rock that was out on the point. We'd go up there and sit there and, and just talk for a long time about the different kinds of moves and the fact that we're playing this game. What does it all mean? And, um, it was really great. So Max and I connected, I think, um, we connected, uh, we, we bonded sort of more cerebrally and more with the game, whereas Carolyn and I was more of a trust and like, hey, let's stick together. And I always went out there intending to try to team up with an older female or somebody who um, might want to stick close to maybe a younger, more physical male. And I've seen, I did a lot of the, I ran a lot of numbers on final tribals and saw that like typically guys who brought um, older women or maybe weaker women slightly, um, you know, either physically or emotionally tended to do really well. 
And I didn't know, obviously, Carolyn's sort of mindset, whether she was, quote, weak or however you might want to uh, say that. But I knew that she was older. And at one point, and especially with her opening up about the idol, it, w- it was a you know a very, very quick connection. And it stayed that way until the moment I left. Was that surprising for her to be able to open up to you about that idol? Because um, she kept that secret so long in the game, basically, except from you. We find that out in the first episode. But... Surprising, but as you were sort of saying, forming the relationship, a good thing at the same time, because you think, well, this lady obviously trusts me enough so early in the game that this is my plan for to be with that sort of old woman is going to work. Yeah, I was surprised. And I was surprised that she never told anybody else as well. And I think the longer we got, further, the further we got in the game, the further we sort of would look at each other and go, I haven't told anybody, I haven't told anybody. And we you know, kind of knew that that was true because nobody had come to us talking about it. And I think it just com- continued to cement our bond as we get into day – you get into day 15, you get into day 21, you've been there three weeks. Now you're into day 25, 28. Nobody's – everyone's still sort of working together. Like that's when it gets scary. And I think she started to hear some voices in her head saying Tyler's going to eventually kind of come, which was true. And I think she decided to um, you know, to make a move uh, very quickly. You, you know, Jeff always talks about you've got to find people to trust in this game. In order to get far, but you know you got also got to know when to pull when to pull the trigger, and that's that's the diff that's the really difficult balance of this game is to trust people but not trust them at the same time. How do you manage that, especially with people you've never really met before? You don't really know what kind of secrets they're holding. I went into the game holding secrets, so I pre- I definitely assumed that other people were doing the same. It's challenging, and that's what makes it so powerful, and that's what makes it so fun to watch. Did did you let anybody know, or did anybody know of your NFL background? No, no, I never said anything about it. I never said anything about the fact that I had two master's degrees. Um, I went to Berkeley and USC, and I told them I went to a small liberal arts school in my hometown of Santa Barbara. <laughs> so I knew if anybody wanted to talk about Santa Barbara, we could do that in, in Southern California. Um, and I never told anybody about football, the fact that I played played five years. Because I figured they'd think, okay, he's wealthy. Oh, he's one of the greatest athletes you know, in the country to be able to play at that kind of a high level. Um, you know, he's, you know, extraordinarily physical Mm. and, um, all three of those things aren't really true. I mean, I was a kicker. I got fired quite a bit. Um, you know, I, I like him. I think I'm I'm a pretty good athlete, but, um, you know, I just, I wanted to dispel any of those notions and just say like, Hey, I'm a writer, you know, and I used to work a white collar desk in Hollywood and I really like, I love to, you know, I love stories, you know, and try to just say, you know, try to play that card a little bit. So, um, and I think it was actually probably one of the biggest lies in the whole game. And nobody, nobody ever found out. And I certainly never, as much as I wanted to break at times, oh, I wanted to tell people. <laughs> um, but it just made it made more sense to sit back and just continue to wait. Well, it was fascinating because I know going into it pre-game and kind of reading on your background and seeing it all, it was it was a very unique, I think, distinction of of your backgrounds from NFL to yeah talent agencies and and writer because every NFL player we've had on Survivor has seemingly been called out at some point or people generally know about their background but you might be and i'd love somebody listening to this or yourself if you know tyler to correct me the first not only nfl player but pro athlete um that has played survivor that hasn't been called out i'm thinking maybe ethan from africa because he was technically a pro soccer player i don't know if that really came into his game much but yeah you could be the first there tyler to pull that off successfully with a lie I, well, I, I don't know if that's a compliment or not. I think, I don't, I don't <laughs> I think, think it's people, a compliment. I think it's a good that's thing. Who I was. <laughs> you know, so usually when they cast athletes, they cast, you know, they cast famous, successful, all pro kind of studs. And I wasn't that guy. I was more of a journeyman. Hmm. And uh, unfortunately, in, in the NFL, the way it's been for many, many years, there isn't a backup kicker or a backup punter. Or else maybe I would have had, you know, been around for a whole lot longer. Maybe it would, my career would have been a 10 or 15 year career. Um, but instead, either you are the guy or you're at home watching on Sundays. Mm-hmm. So I don't I, I mean, in fact, when I was talking with casting about that, I would constantly bring up the fact that, you know, I played football and this was a big part, a massive part of my life for 15 years. At that point, it was like over half of my life had been spent had spent, you know, competing and this is i mean you guys know i mean it's it's you know it's early mornings it's training it's health it's traveling it's difficult it's crying into your carpet because you just got cut after six months of like every working out five hours ten hours a day mm. i mean it's, just, it's this massive massive commitment here i am coming down to these guys saying look like this is a big part of my life and this is why like i'm one of those guys who when he gets knocked down he gets back up like i'll fight 
I know how to battle. I know how to get dirty. Like I'm here to bring my A game to the show. And they looked at me and they said, we don't care. Like you are a nobody in the athletic community. As far as we're concerned, what we care about is the fact that you know how to work in the Hollywood community. And that's what interests us. And so, you know, when you hear these types of things, for those of out, you, uh, out there, um, you know, whether – I don't know if casting is the same out in, you know, in, in, other, in other countries that have these types of shows. But certainly for those, you know, applying in the America – American version of Survivor, like when you hear those types of things, you immediately have to start to connect and realize like, wow, this is how they perceive me. Now this is how I need to be. Because this is what they're looking for. Mm-hmm. And so everything kind of had to shift that way. So when they're like, you're white collar, I'm like, hell yeah, I'm white collar. I guess I'm, I'm going to own that right now. <laughs> um, you know, and I just like to talk about the ways I avoided the football thing. That was an, another reason why. It was I probably, if I, even if I would have said it, I bet it wouldn't even have made the air. Because they never wanted to paint that portrait. Otherwise, be, it becomes too confusing to the audience. It's, oh, wait, he's a football guy. But we're, not, we're not even hearing about that until now. And, but he also, he's, he's listed as a ex you know, agency assistant, does that mean he's unemployed? Like, what is this guy? And the more complicated it gets, the less the characters become so clear. And Survivor's always about clarity when it comes to their characters. Yeah, very true, very true. Maybe one of the most diverse backgrounds throughout, and particularly in a season then when they really are separating people via those collars. Um, Because as you said, you probably realistically could have been on any of them, and obviously nearly were very much on no collar, which would have changed things up completely. One thing, though... um, Obviously, so goes first. You lose the first challenge. But then there's sort of a real gap, I guess, between when you then have to go to tribal. You don't go to a post-switch um, and then in the right. last tribal before the merge. Was there, in that period, any key sort of conversations, deals, or moments that you were involved in that maybe didn't necessarily make it to air that um, that you'd like to share with us today? Because I guess, I mean, we saw a bit of you, but then we didn't see a whole lot of you really until that middle point of the uh-huh. game. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's one of the good things about it is we kind of came together and we said, you know, losing sucks. <laughs> Going to tribal, that sucked. Um, you know, Joaquin was really, you know, obviously very hurt by it because so was his girl. Um, Max and I kind of came together. And my whole thing the whole time was I figured, I just felt, I, I, you know, I don't know how physical I was on the show, but I felt very fit. I felt, I knew that I, you know, at one point played play ball and can go out there and compete and I was looking around and like assessing these people and thinking like I'm a, I'm you know I have to be one of the better athletes out here whether or not that's true or not that's just what the way I felt and so for me I felt that if I was also running around the beach being very strategic making all kinds of alliances playing the game talking about my love of survivor that I'd only be not I'd not only be physical but I'd also be you know this have these other elements as well and then my level of threat status would rise from the orange to the red right to the point where it's like Tyler's just you know, in my mind, obviously, he's so well-rounded, he, we need to get rid of him next. So for me, I became – I tried to really dumb it down, okay? And this is not an excuse, and even though Shireen has kind of called me out on it, that I, he didn't want to strategize. He would just walk away. But for me, it was like, guys, that sucked. If we continue to win or even come in second, we'll never revisit it again. So for me, it became very intentional about pulling Joaquin and saying, bro – me and you are going to carry this whole damn team on our shoulders. Let's go. Max just wanted to win as well. So now we had these three strong guys, and Mama C was so eager to please herself and who also did pretty well in challenges. We had this core group who were like, we're going to we're gonna run this thing. Like we are going to – the five of us, obviously Shereen wanted to talk strategy every single moment she got the chance, and she really wanted to disband this whole notion of strength which I think is why Vetus went home uh, last night. <laughs> I think she was looking for an opportunity to say, like, the all-men alliance is not going to happen because that's going to threaten her because she knows that she is a, well, frankly, horrible in challenges. So that was my sort of my thing is t- let's just unite us as a team that we're going to come up with cheers or high fives that we're going to kind of love on each other as silly as it is, that we're going to unite together. We're going to really bond over winning. And that's, we're never going to have to worry about the negative aspects of, of the game. Hmm. I mean, I really think in looking at the two tribes, I, I forget which was which, but I'm, you know, the tribe with Joe and I mean, and Tosh and Jeremy, like they are a strong tribe, but those guys just continue to kind of just, I mean, whoop some butt. They don't have to worry about the hardest parts of Survivor. They can coast to the mix-up or merge or whatever's next because they never go to tribal. These are important types of things. And so, you know, that that was a lot of the off-camera, quote-unquote, conversation that we had is, 
it was sort of the Raiders, the Raiders notion. It was the motto of just, just win baby. Like let's not make it difficult on ourselves. And we, like you said, Ben, we never went back to tribal again for, you know, four or five tribals. And we kind of got a chance to sort of deplete the other teams. And when you go to that tribal, it's, uh, of course, learnt that it was a thrown challenge. Now, were you uh, in this plan at all, Tyler, the whole trying to save Kelly aspect thing with Mike? I mean, did was this all of a shock to you when you saw it on screen? Well, it wasn't a shock to me when I saw it on screen because I had learned about it then, but it was a shock to me that on day 39 when everybody gets to Ponderosa and, and we're all there and Mike's like, oh, yeah, that, by the way, that was a throne challenge. Like, what? <laughs> Especially because I had grown really close to Dan. After Mike's blow up at the auction, Dan's, Dan and Mike were kind of the bros. And he, I started to really kind of try to get into Dan's head and be like, yo, man, like, you know, what Mike did wasn't cool. And he'd be like, damn right, it's not cool. And so Dan and I began to kind of really bond over that. To the point where I feel like Mike has even still claimed to this day that my best move in the game was luring Dan away for as long as we did. Um, so, no, I didn't know it was a throne challenge. And, you know, when you watch it back, you're seeing, you know, obviously we're all mic'd up within inches of our mouths and you can watch the way they're working together. But throne challenges up until that point had always been unsuccessful. Um, people will still claim they're always unsuccessful. But I think Mike and the blue collars prove that they can absolutely be completely successful. Mm-hmm. Um you know, and and we had actually, I think in the game they said it was like best out of, or in the edit it was best out of five. We played best out of seven, and I actually won two of my memory challenges on the very first try uh, by beating Jen. And they edited those out because they really had no, they really just slowed down the the episode and had no, um, didn't really affect the outcome much. So at home you're sitting there with your friends and family going, oh, I did so well in this challenge, and then you watch and you're like. I'm not even appearing. And that became sort of like my MO throughout the entire course of the season. Um, you know, and that, you know, we talked about that at the very beginning of the, of the conversation, Ben, about like the edit is, it's real. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't, that also doesn't define me. And so, um, fandom is, a fickle and you kind of embrace it, but then you sort of move on to, you know, who you truly are and who your friends and family are. And you can't let those things bother you. It was so fascinating with your edit because there were several points in the season. I remember when we're doing things like our rankings and talking about the episodes each week that we're rating you really highly. And there were many weeks that we were putting you in easily the top couple that could win the game. And then we saw some votes where you weren't there. And there was the one where you were like, Oh, I don't know what's going on. And we were kind of like, Oh, what's Tyler doing now? But it was a unique edit and I think when your vote eventually came about we were still talking highly the fact that you could win it of course we're all I think deep down trying to be like well Mike can't win every single challenge going towards the end of the game so right. you know Tyler's going to be a big threat but it, it just it's interesting I guess and sort of as we've been talking about the whole edit side of things but when you're playing out there did you feel that you were within a good chance of winning the game post-merge? Yes, very close. And I still believe to this day, and, and after talking with everybody, I still believe that I was very close. I mean, if we had stuck together um, the way our final four, our Access of Evil, had agreed to, we could have depleted the, uh, you know, the blue collars with Mike and Dan and Sierra. And then, um, you know, let let Rodney, Will, and, and Carolyn vote me out the top four. We had a guaranteed top four. They decided to split it all up. It got really nasty. Mike had nobody, no, really no competition, and he ran the whole table. Um, so, yeah, you, when you look back, you're like, it really was that close. I always kind of, you know, I played, I went out there and played with a poker face. And I got, I got kind of, I got yelled at a lot by production for that. You know, they would sit there and go, like, you're about to win this game right now, Tyler. As we got further and further along, you're the front runner right now to win this game. Congratulations, but nobody's ever going to remember who you were. And at the time, I was like, I don't really care. <laughs> like, I'm out here to win. I don't really care what the story is. But, you know, I had never been on TV like this before. I had never seen the edit. I've never analyzed the edits as, like, a lot of you guys had. I never realized how important it was to be a character and to be entertaining. Because I can be that in my real life. But the reality was I went out there and I just said, if I just sit back and kind of shut up, everybody comes to me and they vomit all the information onto me. And I go, ah, yeah, that sucks. Ah, my heart breaks for you. Tell me more. <laughs> and the people would just go off about how annoying Rodney was or how Mike was out of control or how Sierra would always – like like a magnet would just come right back into the hands of the blue collars who you know treated her with such 
you know, hate and, and would yell at her. And it was just, you could just sit back and collect it all. And I always, I always felt like I was this snake in the grass, just waiting, waiting, just getting all the information, like, you know, seeing this, the mouse through the, through the, through the thick waves and just kind of moving my way forward. And then all of a sudden, right as you strike, a hawk hits you from behind and you're like, but I had waited for hours. Like I, I spent so much time. And if I had known that they were coming, boy, I would have blown it up, man. I, mm. I said this in my exit interviews. I'm not a quiet person in real life and I'm certainly not one to be pushed around. I would have gone off, but it just made so – it didn't make any sense for them to be going for me right then and there. It made sense for us to continue to deplete the blue collars and unfortunately – when you team up with people, I'm not going to use the word goats because I think, they think they're better than that, but Rodney and Will had never seen an episode of Survivor in their lives. And Carolyn um, had seen it all, was a big fan, but was always consistently second-guessing and was very easily moved by whatever I would say. We're going after Rodney. No, we're not. He's part of our alliance. We're going to go after Sierra. Okay, sounds good. And she would vote that way. <laughs> so you know, those three people were easily maneuverable in my eyes. And so – but at the same time – because they didn't have that experience or lack that confidence, they're also the ones who would be like, let's flip on Tyler. It's really easy. Mm. Um, and so, you know, part of me, I look at season 31 and go, gosh, it'd be so much more fun to play with smart, savvy players. At the other hand, I, you know, you can't, it, it's very difficult to go far with smart, savvy players who will make the proper moves for themselves. It's much easier to manipulate the quote said goats. And I guess with that relationship that you'd form with Carolyn, I mean, we know Survivor is a game filled with emotions, and um, you know, it's you've got to try and put those connections and those personal things aside when you do the voting. But I guess it is hard to swallow when you find out that Carolyn voted for you. I mean, was that the most difficult vote that you found out that you'd had received to kind of to accept when you got voted out? Well, I mean, it was the last vote. So, yeah, it's always difficult to, to swallow. But at the same time, like, good for her. We Look, we were going for her. We were coming for her. After Rodney's damn birthday and Carolyn didn't switch with him, he came back, I mean, spewing the most hatred, I mean, the most the most disgusting things about Carolyn. And I would just go, I would just listen and nod my head. And I went up to Will because those guys were off on their big adventure at the, um, at the little um, – at the orphan uh, refuge or whatever it was. And I'm like, Will, you know, if anybody would, you would send anybody home. He's like, Oh mom, see definitely what she did with Rodney was messed up. Of course, Rodney agreed with that. So suddenly I had three votes. If you included myself without me even saying a word. So nobody could ever like, can, you know, nobody ever point the fingers and say Tyler had this whole master plan about Carolyn. But the whole thing was to team up. And of course, Dan was very, very close to me and say like, there's our four. Let's go after Carolyn. But then we get out to the challenge. And of course it's another, stupid endurance challenge which are just so difficult for you know they're difficult for big people and you know i was i went into the game at 215 at that point i was probably you know still close to 200 pounds um you know like it's it's a very hard thing to, especially when you've lost so much muscle as well and to hold on for those things and and, and, you know, I looked at her and she said she was totally good and I couldn't hang anymore and you fall in. And now suddenly you got to switch gears because we were, I was going to tell her everything was good and then we were going to target her and hopefully, you know, get rid of that idol and continue to move on. So, um, I completely forget what your question was. I've been sorry if I've been it rambling on all of these all things. It happens all the time, but, uh, Tyler. I'm used to it. I, I start off with A and we end up at like J. So it's <laughs> welcome to Survivor Oz. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, one thing though, getting to the end of the game and obviously the voting, um, you vote for Mike. Is, is this going into these final tribal councils? We always like to kind of get a vibe of the juries because we know it's sort of a lot different now in modern Survivor as to going in and the conversations that are had at Ponderosa and everything like that. But did you always right. go in knowing you're going to vote for Mike? Was there ever any question in your mind that you could have changed that at the end or was it always Mike heading into that? No, it was never. It was, wasn't was Mike for, for very long. I mean, we'd always come back, walk into Tribal, sit down and we'd look and we'd see Mike with the necklace and we'd be like, are you kidding me? Like, how is this guy... Well, of course this is how he's doing. He's beating a bunch of people who aren't good at challenges. This is, of course he's... You know, deserves to be wearing the the necklace, and he can, he would just did it over and over and over again, and he would just sit there at tribal with the biggest grin on his mouth, um, you know, and he he Mike, you know Mike for 
he, I mean, yes, he had a winner's edit. People, some people have complained about Mike's edit being just so overtly positive, but the guy was good TV. He was up and down and back and forth. But for us on the island, it was a little more. I mean, Mike was not consistently good. I mean, he'd come up and be like, "Carolyn's coming for you," and I'd walk over to her patiently and be like, "How you doing?" She's like, "Great." She's like, Mike just said, I'm, you know, you're coming for me. I'm like, he just said, you're coming for me. And we'd shake hands and give a hug and we'd walk off. He was constantly throwing out stuff that was just junk. So, you know, at the end of the game and Mike's still standing, it's like, this is the guy who just threw junk around, you know? Well, now if you edit out a lot of that junk and the dude looks like he's batting 900, it's, you know, it's a pretty sexy edit. But at the end of the day, I looked at it and said, this is a guy who should have went home at the, at the auction, was fortunately played an idol that got me out, and then also went on a huge run that you have to agree is one of the greatest runs in the history of the show. Regardless of who he was beating, it's still really damn impressive. So I looked at Will, and I'm like, I don't know how Will got here, but he did. So we got we to gotta study that because that's – for a guy who never saw the show, was cast like two days before we flew to Nicaragua – Good for him. And then Carolyn was my girl, and she got me, which I am always – I was not angry about it at all. Like, good for you. You played – you outplayed me. You bested me. And you were my girl this whole time. We worked together. So I think you know she thought even up to – all the way up to the finale that she had my vote was actually unfortunately pretty heartbroken about it. So at the end of the day, I just looked and said, I think Mike – deserved to be out weeks ago he somehow outlasted he obviously outplayed some of the most and you know some of the biggest players in the history of the game like you know for me i think he deserves my vote because i was voting for first place i wasn't voting for second or third or to, to split a tie he deserved my vote and obviously everybody else kind of agreed with me mm-hmm Mm-hmm. And uh, rest is history, and Mike wins. So <laughs> that's how it all goes down. Going to get some listener questions here in a moment, Tyler, and we'll uh, wrap it up with our final five. But um, just a couple ones here before we get to those. Uh, we mentioned, of course, yeah. the new season that's just started, Survivor Second Chances, um, the whole voting situation that happened. Were you approached at all? Did anyone tap you on the shoulder and say, Tyler, would you maybe like to come back? And did you get anywhere near coming back again a second time? I got nothing. Nothing? I got nothing. You know, and I and I'm you know I'm okay with that. I I I get I get it now. You know, if I could play again, and I don't think I ever will be asked back just based on the edit alone. But if I could play again, I understand now. I, I, I've learned so much, um, you know, by watching myself. In fact, when I got back home, within two weeks of me getting returning from Nicaragua, I got asked to do an interview. Uh, for about my, my college football team. And I went in there. I'm like, dude, all I've been doing are like on-camera interviews. I can knock this out easily. And I went in there, and I did the interview, and it aired, and it was fine. And I was like, all right. Well, I was, I was a little boring in that interview, but that, that was okay. And then I came, then the show came out. And you're you know obviously you're criticized. You're ripped apart. You're loved. You're hated for everything. But I continue to watch myself, and I'm like, golly, like – I'm speaking to the cameraman as if I'm kind of dealing – like this is like a, a post-game press conference. <laughs> you know, and of course, you you are taught to speak a certain way as a, as a player, as an athlete mm-hmm. in our society. You know, this to not give things away, is to be very, you know, precise, to maybe even at times be very vague about things, is to not fire up the other team. And I found that I was like sort of treating Survivor that way. And it, the way I would play it with a poker face on – out there i wasn't able to then walk 100 yards to where the camera crew was set up and then become this guy who was like let's go rodney's stupid you know like whatever (laughs) it might be that would be more that would be a better dichotomy and that's what something like what jeff arner i think is doing really well right now is he's able to go out there and you know kind of listen and nod and say yes to everything but he's able to come back then and be really electric in how he presents it and so for me like I have learned so much, even just how I speak to people, like even speaking to you right now, Ben, or speaking to people on the street. Um, I, 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 I know now how I've been perceived and I know how I perceive myself. And it's totally changed. Like I said, Survivor changes a lot about you, but it's completely changed how I, you know, how I communicate with people. Um, because I know how I'm feeling inside, but sometimes it's very difficult to get that across unless you've sort of been taught. And I was never really pulled out – that was never really pulled out of me by the producers to say, hey, man, like there was somebody who just sort of said like let's watch back this footage real quick or you got to give us more life. You're a little boring or that, that wasn't clear enough or, or be more candid. One of those little instructions I think would have really lit a fire or certainly would have got a light bulb would have went off. Um, but it never happened. And so I kind of felt like, wait, what I'm doing is sort of working. 
And I realize it's not. And I realize now what makes good TV. I really realize now certainly what makes good Survivor players. And I think that opportunity has sort of passed me by. And I'm, I'm totally okay with it because I never went into Survivor thinking like, well, I'll do as best I can the first time, but the second time is going to be really great. Hmm. Um, it was always like, let's just go out and do the best you can because you're probably never going to get another shot at this. So I was never approached for second chances. I don't believe I ever will be. Um, but if I do... I realize now like how to have fun and how to kind of goof off with people. And plus I feel like I went pretty far. So I, you know, I could go out there and just and be myself and blow it up. And even if I go out early, um, you know, what fun to, you know, kind of like brush the shoulders off a little bit and, and sort of, and sort of go crazy. So, um, that's where it's at. And, you know, I look, I look at Mike, I look at Rodney, and even Max to a certain degree. And like, these guys are good TV. They're interesting to watch. They're great characters. And that's really fun. But I have had a lot of people on the street approach me and say like, you are not crazy. And sometimes season 30 became very crazy. And that was nice to feel like I had somebody who I kind of understood from a real world perspective. So I don't know. It's hit or miss. It's all over the place, Ben. I like that comparison. Uh, went a bit crazy. You look at, you know, a Rodney, a Dan versus uh, Tyler. <laughs> and, like, it's a real calming factor. Like, ah, Tyler calm. Rodney, Tyler. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. Sort of balanced out a little bit there. And just also, if we get to listen to questions, uh, you mentioning obviously what um, sort of moving into writing everything I mean, what else are the plans for the rest of uh 2015 just continuing on with writing now and focusing on this uh screenplay that you mentioned you're involved in yeah i mean that's that's part of it I'm, I'm pushing a few projects forward it's funny actually when i got back from the show i realized like how important comfort and shelter and food is I mean, you, you can't you can't escape the fact and so i actually came back and started working part-time in the new year um working for a local homeless shelter here in Pasadena. And Fantastic. it's been incredibly amazing um, and difficult and fun and heartbreaking and heartwarming all at the same. So it's allowed me, and it's allowed me a lot of the freedom to just get up and go and to travel all across the country and going to charity events and meeting fans. We did a whole tour that started up in Boston and went all the way down to Orlando, raising money along the way in between two charity events in both of those cities. Um, and it was crazy. It was, the, you know, six or seven of us from the Dirty 30 driving down in a, in a van, stopping with fans. I mean, I couldn't do that if I was working a full-time job or, um, you know, or, or writing full-time. So I kind of said, like, look, I'm going to enjoy this new season of life and because um, it's going to end. And as of last night, Ben, it ended. <laughs> it officially ended. We're on to something new, and, and I'm excited about it. But um, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to go big. I'm going to have fun and go crazy and go wild and enjoy it all and now that things are slowing down yeah like you know writing is going to come back into play um i've got an interview coming up with the studio in uh in two weeks which i'm really excited about it's kind of one of my dream jobs um and uh, I'm, i really want to start to thinking of, i want, want to think about career and want to think about family my wife and i have been married 11 years in october and so it's like you know let's start to think about what's the next steps there and um, all I know right now, though, is that I'm sort of been. I feel like I've been called to serve at this shelter and to love on my community and to just be a part, be present here, and that that sits really well with me. So that's uh, you know, that's you know an example of how Survivor it, it it does transform a lot of things in your life. For me, there's you know a couple examples of it. Fantastic, good to hear, and we like hearing that sort of stuff post Survivor. Always get that update <laughs> and. Uh, great and the charity uh, events and the bus that sounded like a fun ride I'm, I'm actually um heading to reality rally next year in april in california and julian yeah. larson i don't know if you've had much to do with her but i'm sort of i'm being recruited to be a recruiter tyler so um, if you're around temecula california in april come to reality rally there you go there's my role as a recruiter done on this interview <laughs> let me know but i it's that's a, like a it's a two-hour drive from la i mean i can be my grandparents live in temecula i can crash on their bed there you, you know, go like, we'll, let's make and we'll so, do we'll do this well, interview in person. I am 
<laughs> not in bed with my grandparents. Right. Okay? My okay. grandparents have a spare room. I can split. Good. Time. Good. All right. Yeah. Just making Perfect. sure. Yes. No. We'll uh, we'll we'll communicate between now and then. Get the dirty thirty along, and we can do all this sort of stuff in person. But uh, that's for another time. Yeah. Uh, now, list right list of questions. A few of these, obviously, as always, have been answered. Thanks everybody who sent these in. Survivorods at hotmail dot com dot au is where you send them, or of course on Facebook. Just see who we've got coming up on the show now. Uh, Nick Chester, who's one of our Oslets. He has an interesting question here. He says, just after you were voted out, did you consider yelling out that Carolyn had an idol and blow her up on the way out of the game? <laughs> well, of course, knowing what I know now, absolutely I would have ripped her. <laughs> I would have I would have yelled it out. I probably walked up and kissed her on the cheek and whispered, like, you better play that damn idol next <laughs> next vote. You know, like so I would have had fun with I don't know what it would the thing was, I was so in a daze because at that point I'd been you know, undefeated and everything that I had kind of called in the game outside of the Joaquin vote had sort of come true. And all of a sudden Jeff's going like the, whatever person voted out is Tyler. And it's like, what, wait, what just happened? How does that votes match up? And then you're on autopilot, you're grabbing your torch and you're walking to Jeff and he's snuffing it. And then I'm suddenly thinking now, where do I walk now? And oh my gosh, is there going to be pizza? And then I'm on a car and I'm still have no idea like how the votes went. And it wasn't until, um, you know, I think, Till who was voted out next, Dan. And Dan came up and he was like, you know, like this is how it all went down. And Mike went over to Sierra and Carolyn flipped it. And I'm like, ah, it's all becoming so real. And so, yeah, like you leave knowing you've like waited and collected all this information. You've got all this sexy stuff that you can just change the game in a heartbeat if you expose it. And they get you. So on one hand, yeah, I mean, would I love to just throw it out there? On the other hand, I also saw like Survivor – I kind of like, I love honoring Survivor, and that's maybe not a good TV as well. <laughs> but like, I saw it as war, and there's no, there's no respawn in Survivor. You can't, you don't get shot, and then just like you come back again, and you have the information that you, you know, that you had before. There's no Redemption Island, certainly with us. For me, it was like you got shot, you got bested. You can't yell out where the enemy was or what the enemy, the, the knowledge that you had. You're dead. You walk off and let the game go on because they got you. And so that's. That was sort of a combination of the two. Was, you know, even if even if she hadn't voted for me and I would have yelled out, I felt that would have been a fun thing. It would have made the game more interesting. It would have hurt her in a lot of ways. But um, I just felt like whoever got me got me. So I'm out, I'm out of here. I'm going to go get wine. <laughs> yes. And the, and the Pete. Yeah, just you're thinking of food. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Now, Isaac Brow, he's, he's got a couple of questions here that have been answered, but I just want to read out his opening party because this is actually quite interesting. He says, um, Tyler, how's it going? I remember I met you in person while you visited Cincinnati in June for the Reality for Diabetes group. It was the one at the Northgate Mall. I was so happy to see you guys there. I was very. It was a very great day for me and my family. I was one of the first people there that day and I remember Mike and Sierra were there from your season. I think you played a very good game. You would be my other person I would root for if Mike was ever voted off. I think you would be a great choice to come back to another season because of how you did not give, how you did not give much away to your castaways on how your plan was going to go. So I just wanted to share that. I think that's a nice little story. That's nice. I remember that. I remember that moment. Grant, we met a lot of people that day, so I'm sorry, buddy. I... You know, it's hard to put you know names and faces back to memory, but that was a really cool charity event and a really cool time in Cincinnati. And thank you for the compliment. <laughs> Again, if people want to tweet at Jeff Probes or whatever his Twitter is and say Tyler, but I, you know, I think Jeff's a little preoccupied right now and <laughs> other exciting events in the Survivor Survivor sphere. So. Um, but thank you. Very nice things. Uh, Jordan Tyler in a Carolyn Rodney and Will final three. Who do you vote for? Carolyn. Carolyn? Yeah. For me, Carolyn, yeah. And another part to that question, Jordan says, in a Rodney, Sierra, and Will final three, who do you vote for? Uh, you got to really look at how Sierra got there. Did she win? Did she, was she winning challenges? Was Rodney w- winning challenges? Probably not. <laughs> you know, so how was she getting there? And the fact that, you know, she should have flipped three or four times but didn't um, and somehow got to the end, that's going to say, that, like, hey, everything. I, look, I went to Sierra right at the merge. Uh, or, or the mix up even, I said, I want to take you to the very end. Like the blue collars treated you horribly. Come with me and come with me. If you want to live, like come with me, <laughs> and I will take you further than I'll take Carolyn. I didn't say that, but like I was going to ditch Carolyn and take Sierra because I knew that Sierra was beaten down. She would do anything to get away from those guys, but yet she went back to them 
and she went back to him again and again. And when Mike freaked out, she went back again. And so now if I look at that and go, I wanted her to come with me, and yet she didn't, and now she's in the final three, she knew something that I didn't know. And that's that's pretty powerful. Um, but, you know, a lot of people, you know, Rodney, Rodney got a very positive edit as to how he was, like, manipulating the axis of evil. It, it, it wasn't as it wasn't as um, overt as it was made to see but um, Rodney was also a really good TV so if you can kind of pit Rodney versus Mike when I do believe and I mean this humbly that it was Mike versus Tyler um, you know it's more exciting to watch Rodney stomp around on a beach for 30 minutes screaming about his damn birthday and <laughs> And, you know, doing this whole thing, he's going to fake quit. Th- those are more exciting things to watch, even though all of us are sitting in the shelter going, what is he doing? This is so lame and not giving it a second thought. It becomes like the entire aspect. It becomes the entire episode. Mm-hmm. And for all of us, it was just like an aside. It was like that's what Vita said last night. I, I was at a party with Vita and he was like, Abby, Abby and her bracelet. I was there with PG as well. Abby and the bracelet. All of us were like, is she still going on about this? It's been like an hour, and she's this is all she, we're all trying to build a shelter. It's all she cares about. Nobody cares. And yet it becomes the way to kind of color in Abby and the way to kind of like maybe set up something with her and PG. I don't know. Like it becomes, you know, it's good TV to watch the crazies be crazy. <laughs> and I never really set out to be crazy. Well, I'll tell you what. If you use a Terminator quote, then um, maybe they, <laughs> in an Arnold accent, they um, could have edited you a little <laughs> bit differently. <laughs> See? I messed up. I should have. Ben, get me back. Yes, yeah, I will. I'll try. And then you can just spend your days walking around the beach going, Sarah Connor. Um, and <laughs> they will have you out there every day of the week. Um, Jack G asks, why didn't you bid for the advantage at the auction? You had five hundred dollars i did ah it's a good question jack g good question you know typically the last time i think we saw a split was what Kagion with um spencer and tony and it was like 50 50 Mm -hmm. it wasn't about the money at all although 500 dollars is always nice to have um but so jeff at one point uh, he still there was still plenty of food apparently that they had back there we were later told by production there was a couple more plates and more excitement he finally just goes, all right, nobody's really bidding on his, uh, his crap. Like, who just wants to wait? And four of us raise our hands. It's me, Carolyn, Dan, and Mike. And he's like, well, let's, you know, so, all right, well, that's, you guys want to wait? You're going to wait? All right, fine. Let's do another plate. He does another plate of food. And, you know, Rodney had one. Rodney had one. It was like a ver- door A versus door B. And door B was steak. And door A was um, snails. And he stuck with it. And he got steak. So it was a lot, everybody was winning. Everybody was getting food. It was really exciting. And uh, finally, they come around and go, who's going to do it? And the, all four get ready to go. And I'm suddenly s- sitting here going, one out of four odds. This is horrible. This is horrible. This is not working. Like, this is the ch- odds are not good. And what they did right off the bat was something we had never seen before in Survivor, which was, hey, welcome to the auction. Will, you're out of here. And I'm thinking, like, what if Jeff goes, this is something you're all waiting for? And it's a clue or an advantage to something. And then we're all thinking, all right, yay, it's fun and games, it's over. And he goes, oh, by the way, we started this, we're starting the auction the same way we're ending it. Y'all ain't seen this before either. And it's something new, it's something interesting. Well, guess who's got more money than anybody else sitting on those benches? Me, because everybody else went in there. And of course, Jeff goes, great, it's over, boom. And like, you know, throws his gavel down. And it was just another example of me overthinking the game. And, you know, trying to outsmart Survivor when in reality it's like just, you know, go with your gut. And I've had a couple of people actually come up to me and say, well, Ty, if you had gone up there, it was a 50-50 shot if you look at it because it's you and Carolyn versus Dan and Mike. And I, to be honest, I never really thought it that way. Hmm. Um, and that's actually not a bad point. But, you know, if I win that advantage – and most of the time they weren't advantages, right? They were – they were um, well, um, they weren't. They were advantages typically in the next challenge. Yeah. It's not something that could be split. So there wasn't really going to be a 50-50 version. It was like Tyler goes up one level. Um, so for me, I thought one out of four was bad odds. I want to see and wait what Jeff has and the producers have down the road for me. And, of course, all they had was me trying to, like, keep an eye on $500 for the next 20 days that I was out there, which was stupid in the rain and annoying. And then my wife and I actually, just a small little aside, we get back home and I go, hey, I got 480 bucks from the auction. Let's go on a cruise. Let's go down to Mexico. So we go down like a little three or four day cruise down to Mexico. And of course, the very last day, we both get 
we've and we've been on like six or seven cruises together. Like we love to cruise, and Mexico's very short, a short you know days trip away from here in L.A. And we both get horrible food poisoning. Mm. I mean, horrible. Like I I am out of commission for hours on the it's the morning of that we're supposed to disembark and get off the ship and it was just like you know what that's what you get you idiot for overthinking and now you know a month after you get back from survivor like you're still paying for it you punk so um, anyway that's the story of the auction and my money there you go thanks jack now one last one before i get into our final five here tyler and i, I say this one to last because i uh know you're a massive star wars fan uh willie Lashawn, and uh, we also had a couple others here uh, send this one in too Thoughts on uh, The Force Awakens. Uh, we saw your reaction video to the trailer, and um, I, I think you are just counting down the minutes, no doubt, to this comes out in December. Counting down, buddy. Counting down. In fact, that that reaction trailer, I was just going to film for me. I was like, oh, it'd be funny to like just. I, I've never done anything like that. I'll just film myself, and I'll you know can look back on this years from now. And I texted a couple of my friends. I'm like, hey guys, I actually filmed myself watching it. Can you believe what we saw today? And they were like, well, send it to us. And it was too big of a file to email. Or to text. So I'm like, I'll just throw it up on YouTube. And I threw it up on YouTube and sent it to him. And somehow somebody got a hold of it and it just got all – I did I did not mean. It was not a narcissistic move, guys. I swear. It was so, totally meant to be shared between me and my like five other Survivor dork buddies. But yes, counting down the minutes. I mean, gosh, I was just on Facebook yesterday looking at the 360 version of the Battle of Jakku from Ray Speeder. Come on, guys. <laughs> I can talk this game up. I thought about flying out there out to y'all's spot to go, you know, when F, they were shooting episode one out there in Sydney and, and shooting at the studios and like, how can I get out there? How can I? So yeah, I'm eating it up. And one of the interviews that I've got coming up is over with Disney to talk about, you know, ways to get into the star Wars universe. So, um, look, I love storytelling. I love world building, um, whether that's in movies or being a writer or maybe being a part of the Disney parks and sort of that whole experience. I want to, I love immersive things. It's one of the reasons why I love Survivor because it is so completely immersive. Fantastic. Well, uh, if we ever do a Star Wars episode, Tyler, we'll um, be sure to call you back. Um, I think Bro. you did the first one. That'll be, that'll be my, that'll be my Survivor Oz second chances. Yes. So that'll be my. Uh, that'll be my one chance <laughs> now Tyler we close out every interview with a set of quick fire questions just some various opinions on things and uh, no uh, right or wrong answers just uh, entirely the thoughts of Tyler Fredrickson the first question I will ask you what are three things you learnt about Jeff Probst uh, during your time on Survivor that dude swears like a sailor <laughs> um, so that was cool he he has the most intense eye contact. He looks like he just wants to like suck your soul through your forehead. I mean, the guy will just stare at you. Um, and he also comes very, very hard at you at tribal. He knows everything. So he comes very hard. And if he doesn't like what you're giving him, he will scream at you and he'll just make you feel, fortunately he didn't really come at me like this, but he's like, I mean, he'll come hard at you. This is not what we're looking for. You're wasting my time. Forget it. Let's go to Will. Will, what do you think? Will, same thing. This is a bunch of bulls. I mean, he will go off. And then, of course, none of it makes the air, but it puts people on their heels. And, you know, sometimes they reveal way more than they should. Yeah, well, we, we, I love hearing all these things about him when he um, has this. And um, I just, again, I've always said this. I want to be a fly on the wall at this tribal council. Just see it. Because I, I want to see Jeff Probst just go off with swearing. And I've seen a couple of interviews where Jeff Probst swears. And it's a unique thing from a fan's perspective to see that. But, of course, you're out there living it. And probably three days in, oh, here goes Jeff dropping a couple of words that I don't think my mum wants to know about. So... <laughs> yeah, you got to get in with Gordon Holmes and Dalton and all these guys who are able to go out for three yep. days and then watch the tribal me. Yep, yep. I think I need to uh, get into that little click and I'll be set. Uh, question number two, Tyler. What is your favorite and least favorite season of Survivor? My favorite is probably Heroes versus Villains. That's the one that kind of just got me back into it all. And my least favorite, I don't know if I have one. Um, I don't. I, honestly, I don't know them all super well, so it's probably one that I haven't seen. Cool. Sorry, just the answer sucks. Go with season twenty-two. Everyone does. Um, question number three. I know, okay. I know you're a happily married man, Tyler. Eleven years. Congratulations. But uh, in terms of our next question, might be a bit difficult. Who do you is the sexiest ever Survivor contestant? Hmm. Parv. Parv is so. I mean, she has a way of just capturing. She's so charismatic. I also think Natalie Tenerelli, who's actually a good friend of mine, is really, really pretty. Mm-hmm. So, but Parv just has a way of like she's. 
she's just glowing and she smiles at you like nothing else matters. And that's, you know, it's good TV. Mm -hmm. Good answer. Question number four. Who to you is the greatest player never to have won? Probably Russell. Mm -hmm. Um, Just because, but he's also, you know, pretty psychotic as well. But I got to know Russell a little bit this summer and he was really great and charming and, and crazy. And he's so full of himself. But I always kind of felt that that guy... You know, granted, the social game was a little all over the place, but he was, he also, him and Boston and Rob sort of rejuvenated my whole love of the game. So I like him. Fantastic. Uh, question number five Tyler, who do you is your least favorite winner? <sighs> Mike Holloway. Hmm. Yes. Let's just put it out there. Okay. You beat me. Yep. Well, it's it's a valid point. We, we expect more of those answers, I feel, in that category. We don't get them, but. We'll take it. Uh, question number six, the final question for you today. Tyler Fredrickson, in the history of Survivor, who to you is the greatest ever contestant and why? Uh, probably Rob. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's so it's so boring. It's I know it's so boring. In fact, in my pregame interviews, I said, I'm most like Boss and Rob. I thought that was going to be a way to get the attention of the, you know, of the, of the of casting, let alone, I didn't know they hear about it all the time from that like that. But Rob, I mean, just, yeah, he, he comes back, he plays to his whole heart. He's, he's exciting to watch and he was able to, he's able to manipulate everybody, control big, huge groups of people. And he's, that's, that's good. It's good stuff. And his numbers don't lie. Exactly. There you go. Done. Tyler, mate, it's been a lot of fun. We really appreciate your time here on the show. We'll say good luck with everything in the future, with all your, your interviews and, uh, Fingers crossed for the Disney one and uh, obviously enjoying Star Wars in a couple of months. And uh, for sure, not only do we hope to see you on uh, Survivor on our screens one day in the future, but look, we'll get you back on Survivor Oz. We can do an episode recap. We can talk Star Wars. We can shoot the shit at Reality Rally next year. Whatever happens, mate, uh, we'd love to have you back on the show. You call me, bud. I'm in. Let me know. And there we have Tyler Fredrickson, Survivor World Apart. A lot of fun and uh, learning a lot of stuff as we do in all these interviews. Of course, if you want to hear any of our other Worlds Apart interviews, SurvivorOz.com. Click on the Interviews tab. Uh, we do have Dan on there, Carolyn, Jen, and we've got Nina, of course, coming up as well. And more, hopefully, just around the corner. Subscribe on iTunes. Easiest way to get these directly to your device. And remember to rate us on there because we always like to hear your feedback. In the meantime, my name is Ben, the tribe has spoken. Thank you for listening to Survivor Oz, and we'll speak to you next time on As Your Trends.